Hello everyone, my name is Ash Compton, and in this video, I'm going to be sending a 70 ton rocket slash plane to the moon. Not the mun from the stock game, but the moon from the real solar system mod. That's the one that replaces the stock solar system with our solar system from real life. That means I'm going to be launching from Earth, which is about 10 times larger than Kerbin, so it's much harder than the equivalent mission would be in the stock game. To jump right into the mission, the first thing I had to do was to wait for the proper launch window. Here, I'm time warping so that the KSC is aligned with the moon's orbital plane. In essence, you could imagine that we drew a circle around the Earth, and that the KSC was on the tippy-tippy top of that circle. If that is the case with the KSC, then when we launch a craft eastward, its orbital plane would be roughly parallel to the orbital plane of the moon's orbit. So that's why I was time warping there in the beginning. But now, onto the rocket itself, I guess. <laughs> I don't know whether or not to call it a rocket or a space plane, because it has wings, but it ditches those wings as it, the staging goes on. So I guess the first stage, as you can see, is six whiplash engines. Now, I had to choose between the whiplash engines and the rapier engines. That was one of the main... I mean, I guess it wasn't really one of the challenges, but that was something that I had to consider. So basically, I went with the Whiplash engines instead because individually they are 0.2 tons lighter than Rapier engines, and then also they have an additional 800 seconds of specific impulse compared to the Rapier engines. The reason why it's kind of a tricky choice is because Rapier engines actually have a higher maximum thrust, which means we would actually be going faster right now if we had been using rapier engines. But I decided to go on the weight saving option in the first stage, so I went with the whiplash engines. Also, you might be noticing I kind of took a steep angle. That's because for some reason on Earth, jet engines, or I guess um, whiplash engines in particular, cut out way before you stop experiencing like a significant amount of drag, I guess you could say. And so, when I would try to do a shallower angle, which would actually make me go a bit faster, it would only make me like go like a, about 20, or no, no, 20, 200 meters a second faster, which isn't a very significant difference. And then also, the vector engine stage would have a lot of problems with instability, and so it would usually end up in disaster, and like flipping around or something like that. So, I went with a steeper angle, so that by the time I got to the vector engine stage, it would have to deal with less drag. Speaking of the vector engine stage, I just put that there because high thrust, high specific impulse for that kind of engine, and then also, it's not like super heavy. I mean, honestly, if I could have gotten this stage to be lighter, then maybe I could have just done like three air spikes then or something. The deal is, Vector engines weigh a total of four tons, which is quite a bit, but I guess it is literally just one more ton than <laughs> three dart engines, like I have here. Speaking of which, you can see I have a line of three aerospike engines now in this stage. Um, that's just because they have a pretty high specific impulse, about 340 seconds, literally 340 seconds. I don't know why I said about. And then also, I think they have a thrust of 180 kilonewtons during, um, or not during, when they're in a vacuum. So, that's another perk. The main downside with aerospike engines, I guess, compared to terrier engines, which is what I would have used as an alternative, is that they weigh twice as much. They weigh one ton as compared to half a ton with terrier engines. So, I might have actually been able to suffice, say, having two Terrier engines in, on, uh, I guess, on the side, instead of having those two other Aerospike engines. But I had problems with thrust-rate ratio, pretty much, where on Earth especially, and this is still true, true for Kerbin, but especially on Earth, thrust-rate ratio is a very important thing, because you have to get... Or, I guess I shouldn't say get, but you have to go through about 9,300 
meters a second of delta v just to get into orbit around earth that's literally how intense the requirements are that's why rockets are so expensive they have to be huge just to carry like a small payload and the thing is when you have a engine with less thrust like this atomic engine here what you can do is pitch them up like this and so long as you are not at like t minus one second to apoapsis you can keep your apoapsis pushed back like that even though you don't have a full i guess units of thrust thrust to weight ratio it's not i mean it's not really a need so okay if you don't have one thrust to weight ratio <laughs> unit or something they're not really in units because thrust is a force weight is a force you divide a force by a force that means the units cancel out and you actually don't have any units in math but that's not really important in essence you can just pitch up and you will continue to ascend when you're going slower though and you're not that close to being into orbit you can't do that so you need an extra amount of or i shouldn't say an extra amount you just need a higher amount of thrust rate ratio so that's why i went with the dart engines but here, if I had gotten this stage, or the, like just the upper parts to be lighter, maybe I could have just scraped by using carrier engines and then made the entire thing a lot lighter. Weight savings kind of tend to have a big cascading effect. Like, say, I were to change in the game files the weight of the atomic engine to one ton from three tons, that would have a huge impact on the rest of the rocket. But I didn't do that because shooting's just kind of pointless. I do YouTube for fun, not really for views, I guess, so why would I? Anyway, though, enough about that. I should probably say with that atomic engine stage, I had that first fuel tank prioritized, and then it decoupled out, which saved me about a quarter of a ton dry mass. So that gave me about 200 delta V with that. Anyway, though, we're already long gone from that in the video. What we're doing now is the terrible ion engine stage where i had to do 32 minutes long and 20 second minute and 20 second long burns 32 minute 20 second long burns it was the most grindy thing that i have ever done in this game ever and i had to do this like i think five times i think i literally did this same burn five times when I was testing this thing. I gotta say, I went through three iterations with this craft, and since I have thought of so many ways that I could improve it and make it even smaller, but I just don't have the will to execute those changes because I am so burned out from making this video. It literally took like a full month, and I'm only now finally doing a voiceover and finishing it off. Enough about that, though. I should say it was about a 4,000 delta V cost, if you're just wondering how much it is to get from the Earth to the Moon. About 4,000 delta V. Just to give you an idea of how delta V costly this mission is and why. I, I bet you could probably get it down to be like a 40-ton rocket or maybe a 20-ton or Like, 20, 20 would be very generous. I don't think you'd... You, Sorry, I don't think you could do it with 20 tons, but you can maybe do it with 30 and probably with 40. Either way, I'm probably done with this. I might return to this idea later. I'm not sure. I want to move on to other things, though, greener pastures, you know. So, what I'm doing here now is just, in essence, I've set my orbit up in a way that I won't naturally get an encounter with the moon until I do one last burn. So, in essence, I set up a maneuver node and then checked a few orbits ahead when, to, or I guess, to see when I would get a moon encounter, and then I just set up the maneuver node for then. It's kind of annoying because this is in 1.6 KSB, actually. And 1.7, I think, was the maneuver node update, which really vastly improved maneuver nodes. Like, they were so annoying. 
especially doing anything that required fine detailing like planning um gravity assists is generally something that's very I don't want to say plenty, but it's very specific. Like, a difference of one meter a second in your velocity can make the difference of kilometer, like, no, millions? Yeah, I guess millions of kilometers with gravity assists. So, 1.7 really helps out with that, but I'm in 1.6 at least, so it was a lot harder to actually... I mean, I guess it wasn't really that hard, but... I could imagine trying to do, like, a mission to Mars, or, no, maybe, like, a mission to one of Jupiter's moons, because you could probably get a gravity assist off of, what's that one moon? G Ganymede? I yeah, Ganymede, I'm pretty sure, is the size of Mercury, actually. So, it's a planet-sized moon orbiting around Jupiter. I think that might be, like, an equivalent of Tyler, pretty much. I think that is literally... What Tyler was based off of, if you go onto the forums, people will say that. Um, which makes sense. If you know what Ganymede looks like, it looks a fair amount like Tylo. It's kind of like splotchy, um, whitish color. And then it's also the biggest moon in the solar system. So you could probably do gravity assists using that. And then the 1.7 maneuver node mechanics might help you out with that. Anyway, though, here... I'm just getting to the part where I get into my parking orbit around the moon. Oh, uh, I guess it's important to discuss the altitude of the parking orbit. So I went with 40 kilometers, which is kind of... I'm going to describe it as lazy, because basically the lower you bring your parking orbit to, the smaller the delta V cost is for landing and ascent back up to that parking orbit. And, obviously, both of those things are very important for this mission, because the delta V translates into fuel mass. Fuel mass is mass. We're trying to reduce mass, so we want to reduce fuel mass. Therefore, we want to reduce delta V costs, of course. So, had I gone with a lower orbit, I definitely could have lowered the mass of this thing. But I think the thing is, if you go below 30 kilometers, you can't time warp around the moon. I'm pretty sure, I mean... It doesn't make sense. I would imagine it would be like three kilometers or something. I think with most moons, it's something like three kilometers. But I think when I was doing one of the tests, I couldn't time warp below 30 kilometers. I'm probably making this up because I was just too lazy to actually go and check. Because like I said, by the time that I got to this part, I was just so done with this entire mission that I just wanted it over with. I did not want to have to go back, do like the whole hour long, yeah, probably hour long ion engine stage burns, um, just to find out that I could move down the fuel notches for the Oscar B tanks and that, like, donut tank thingy down by one notch. I did not feel like doing that. So, I just kind of went with it. Um, actually, initially, I had been doing it at 70 kilometers because when you cheat into an orbit, which is what I use for testing all the time, um, the debug menu, if you just press Alt F2 at the same time, um, you can teleport into orbits around any body, but the thing is, it doesn't let you bring your orbit down below a specific altitude, and for some reason for the moon, it's 70 kilometers, even though you can go way lower than that and be completely over everything, completely fine, you know, no chances of you getting anything, I think. So, I don't know, I guess that's possibly because this is a mod, it might be kind of janky, but, I don't know, it doesn't really matter, it could have literally just added, like, an extra... Um, I guess, test stage to lower my orbit, and then that's actually what I did to test the 40-kilometer orbit. Um, but, yeah, it is what it is, I guess. Maybe, I mean, I'm surprised, I don't think anyone's actually done a smallest mass moon mission yet, which is why I decided to do this. Generally, I try to make new content, you know, I don't really do repeat content very much. That's why I haven't really, I don't think I've done a moon mission. Or no, I have done a moon mission, but it was weird, basically. <laughs> and I don't think anyone had done anything like it. I don't know. See, that's the thing. You can go on YouTube and look up stuff and see nothing, but that doesn't mean that no one's ever done it. Like, that's the same thing I did, um, Moho, just on SRBs, as in a mission to Moho and back using only solid rocket boosters. And I did that because I don't think anyone has done that on YouTube yet. So, I like to contribute to 
the community rather than just copied stuff and not really get it anywhere. You know, if you look at the evolution of KSP videos on YouTube over time, it's pretty amazing. Like, Stratonless is basically my KSP god. Or no, I, mm, see, that's the thing. There's Scott Manley, who everyone loves for obvious reasons. Like, Scott Manley's... I don't want to say aura because that's kind of janky. Um, you know, stage presence. I'll say stage presence is just so natural and good that everyone loves him pretty much. But then you look at Stratton Blitz's videos, which are unscripted, or not unscripted, they don't even have a voiceover most of the time until recently. Um, but they're just so amazing that it's it, it blows my mind every time. I literally don't understand how he does, like, half of his videos. <laughs> they're just that far out. I've never done anything close to what he does, pretty much. I would say, generally. And then there's Matt Lown, who's kind of like... He's just Matt Lown, you know? I mean, I guess Matt Lown's, like, okay, but I feel like... You know, okay, I shouldn't be judging other YouTubers negatively like this. Let's go back to describing what's actually happening in the video like I am supposed to. Alright? No, okay, that got confused. Got that confused. Right, don't you watch much. I love Matt Lowndes, just Matt Lowndes. <laughs> That's so mean. So mean on Matt Lowndes. Oh. Anyway, I shouldn't be judging YouTubers like this. So I'm just gonna go back to describing the video. Except, probably the reason why I've been going off of, off on this tangent is because Descent is like one of the most er, oh, boring, sorry. Boring. Descent is one of the most boring parts of any mission, pretty much. Like, the moon's pretty big, so... I guess it probably takes, like, seven... No, not seven. It takes, like, five minutes from orbit to the moon surface... Lunar, lunar surface, I guess. No, it must be, like, six minutes. But I think this is sped-up footage here. So, I'm just gonna go back to describing the video. Except, probably the reason why I've been going off, of, off on this tangent is because... Descent is one of the most boring parts of any mission, pretty much. Like, the moon's pretty big, so... I guess it probably takes, like, seven... No, not seven. It takes, like, five minutes from orbit to the moon surface... Lunar, lunar surface, I guess. No, it must be, like, six minutes. But I think this is sped-up footage here. Um, I guess it doesn't really matter. So, basically, what I had in the, um... Descent stage was just Oscar B tank, as you can see, and then the donut thing, which I don't know the name of. And then also, <clears throat> in terms of engines, I had two ant engines, um, both at 70% thru uh, yeah, thrust limiter, it's not throttle limiter. Um, and that way, I could just keep the same throttle the whole time, pretty much, which I think is what you're supposed to do. See, that's the thing. Scott Manley would know that. Because Scott Manley has a degree in astrophysics. He would know that. That's why everyone loves Scott Manley. And anyway, let's begin the awkward ritual of planting the flag. Where he hops around a bunch. And then runs around like a circle. And then has to face the craft in a weird direction. So that the flag isn't backwards. And then the awkward. Oh, I don't know what I was supposed to write or... I wasn't supposed to write anything, but I just don't know what to write, and so I just write down something random, you know, just pick, just pick something you see in the room, or something you see on the screen. I went with the Oceanus Procellarum, I don't know how to read that, um, it's actually unreadable for me, because when I do a voiceover, I, um, render the video at a lower quality, so that it takes up less space, in essence. I think it also takes less time to render, but I'm not totally sure about that. Now that that stage is over, I should probably also talk about um, the difference between direct ascent and follow-style landings. So, direct descent makes sense as a phrase. It in a, in a, It, in essence, means that you come straight down your entire rocket, the return stage, the ascent stage and the descent stage all in one rocket. So, if NASA had done that, then they would have done it with the Luna rocket, which had a 
massive ascent stage, very heavy, very costly, and then that's all in the upper stage. So then guess what happens in the lower stage? It becomes huge, comparatively. So when I was first doing this mission, actually, or I guess not really doing this mission, but my first um design, I guess, I don't know if I can really call these things designs. <laughs> They're so... Like, uh, I don't, I don't want to say janky, but, um, yeah, they're just janky. No, I mean, I guess they're, they're it, yeah, it, you know what, it's a design. We're going with that. It is a design. The first design weighed about 600 tons, and I never actually even completed a first test, because I remembered that the Apollo-style missions were a thing. That's where you leave the return stage in orbit, and you have your astronauts, and your equipment and instruments land down on the moon with, or not mun, the moon, or whatever thing you're landing on, without the return stage. And then when they're ready to go home, they pop off, do what Jeb's doing here, orbital rendezvous. They meet up with the return stage, and that way they don't, or I guess they, the astronauts don't carry things around. The Descent stage and ascent stage don't have to carry around the mass of the return stage. All they have to do, or all the ascent stage has to do, is just meet back up with the return stage. And if you do it right, it is essentially the same with the ascent stage as it would have been with the um, return stage. Except you don't have the return stage, so you don't need nearly as much fuel. Anyway, though, uh, so, Orbital Rendezvous. What is it all about? There's a pretty big craze in this game about Orbital Rendezvous. So, basically, Orbital Rendezvous, pretty simple concept. You take two crafts, and you have them meet up in orbit. Hence, that's a rendezvous, where you have two things meet up, and it's orbital, it's in orbit. So, I'm not going to spend that much time talking about it, because it's actually... Really complicated. Um, Matt, uh, no, 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 Matt Lyon. Matt Lyon would never do this. Scott Manley has a entire video dedicated to understanding Orbital Rendezvous. It's really great. I would suggest you would check it out. Anyway, though, my um, what would it be? What's that pop culture reference? My uh, crash course on Orbital Rendezvous is basically you have to wait for the craft that you're trying to dock with to be at a specific place. And then once it is in that specific place, which you usually determine with quick saving and a bunch of attempts, you launch your craft up into orbit around that height. And um, I guess with a heading, is it called a heading? Basically traveling so that it will end up with an orbit that has like the same inclination as the craft that you, that you are trying to rendezvous with. Um, and then you basically just do it enough times that you get it just right and you get into orbit near the craft you're trying to dock with. And then you basically just use the, uh, I guess, docking mode and RCS thrusters to successfully dock. But of course, that never really happens because it's really annoying. And the easier way is to basically just get close to that. And then you'll basically have a bunch of opportunities where, as you saw here, there's basically going to be a bunch of close encounters with the craft. And then every time you go to a close encounter, you burn off your speed relative to the other craft and then burn towards it. And then you just watch the map to see how the next encounter is going and if you keep doing that you'll just keep getting closer and closer and closer there's a lot more to it but that's essentially what i always do every time anyway though we're long past the orbital rendezvous part of the mission here so what i'm doing here is setting up the maneuver node to get jet back home to earth i had a little bit of a problem though so as you can see there's a little red bar at the bottom of the maneuver node bar thingy um, and then also there's like the burn time is red. That basically means you don't have the delta V to carry out the burn. Which is a little bit of a problem. As you can see here with that um, maneuver node, it was going to send me 
quite a bit down, or I guess not me, Jeb. It was going to send Jeb quite a bit down, and we want to send Jeb sideways with respect to the moon's orbital plane, essentially. As it, essentially. The deal with returning from, like, the Mun or Minmus or, like, the moon, you know, this kind of simple return where you're just trying to go back inwards to a, a body that's closer to the center of the orbit, I guess. Or, you know, you're just trying to, like, return to Kerbin from, like, the mud or something. Basically, you set up a maneuver node that will send your craft, I guess, on a trajectory going out away from the direction that the Mun, Moon, or Minmus is traveling, like I did here. So as you can see, this thing is going to fly backwards, and indicated by the boldness of the Moon's orbit there, the line drawing out the Moon's orbit, you can see I'm going to be moving, or Jeb is going to be moving in the opposite direction, which means a loss of velocity at the apoapsis, which means a shorter periapsis, um in your final orbit and we want to be at around 70 kilometers when we're returning so actually i should probably describe what i did here with a bit of time warping so in essence i just waited for the uh return stages orbit slash jeb's orbit um you know i'll just say the craft's orbit to be more i don't want to be vague but i guess in line with the moon's orbit so that the craft moves in the opposite direction that the moon is moving and like only the opposite direction pretty much um it's like i said before what was happening that caused me to have to expend so much delta v to lower my periapsis that much was because the inclination of my orbit there was wrong, or really this the orbit was in the wrong like alignment, I guess you could say. And so, essentially, the problem was a lot of velocity was being wasted going down. Instead of retrograde, it was being wasted going, I guess, anti- what is it? Oh my god, I don't remember the names of the maneuver node positions anymore. So there's like the perpendicular one to orbit, but down. Is it anterior? No, I don't remember. Oh my god. I, I seriously can't remember. Um, basically, it would be sending the craft a lot down, which is wasted velocity for our purpose. So I just got the orbit to be in a better position by time warping, and as you can see, I was able to get the right maneuver node and the right orbit with actually a pretty big excess of delta v i wish i knew about this method i suppose you could say method um earlier when i was first making this mission um just because i probably would have saved a bit of fuel by doing that um but, like I said, I am just too burned out from this video to go back and redo it again for the fourth time. So, this is what you're going to get for now, at least. I might redo it later, but definitely no time soon. But, anyway, this is kind of wrapping up the mission. So, if you're going to go now, a lot of people leave a short time after the end. You know, when the end is clear, just... If you like the video, subscribe or like it. That'll help get more views. And I hope I will see you again in another video. But this is not the actual end. So I'm going to say basically those exact same words a second time in about a minute. So as you can see here, Jebediah is just descending. I want to talk about the heat shield actually. So as you can see, the ablator was absolutely zero by the time it was done with its use. But I may have been able to scrap the heat shield entirely because I saw another video on YouTube that showed, I think, Jebediah kind of upright on the Oscar B fuel tank. And the simple fuel tank served as protection from the terrifying thermo aerodynamics, as Scott Manley said, of re-entry. So, 
if I were to redo this video in Mission, I would probably try that out. And if I could do that, then that would be like a 5% or like 2 No, it would probably be like a 10% um, subtraction of mass from the whole upper stage. Anyway, that brings us to the actual end of the video. I hope you liked it, and if you did, please leave a like, comment, subscribe to my channel, maybe. That's always very um, gratifying. Anyway, as always, see you next time.